Hello everyone, my name is Petr Ögren and in this video I'll tell you what a behavior tree is and how it works. So this is the first lecture in a series called Introduction to Behavior Trees in AI. So what is a behavior tree? A behavior tree is a task switching structure that solves the following problem. Given a set of available actions that we want to switch between, when and to what action do we switch? The most well-known other example of task switching structures is a finite state machine. And now we're going to look at the advantages of behavior trees. So what are the advantages of behavior trees? First, modularity, that is, few dependencies between components. Modularity is well known to be very important when developing pretty much any engineering systems. If you have a modular system, you can design components separately and then put them together. You can replace components, you can check components for errors and debug them separately, and so on. Behavior trees also have a built-in hierarchical structure. So as you might have noticed, actions exist on many levels of details. For instance, you might say, I'm going to work. Uh, and that action, that high-level action, probably includes driving a car or taking a train, depending on how far you have to work. Driving a car, in turn, probably includes, at some point, turning left, turning right, and so on. And turning left with a car probably includes a sub-action of moving your arm, uh, braking, uh, applying the gas, and so on. So actions do exist on many levels, and it's nice to have a task switching structure that captures this hierarchical structure in a natural way. Behavior tra trees uh, do this. They also have a fairly straightforward graphical representation, which is good when you want to communicate uh, or design your solutions. Uh, and then more, <clears throat> more in detail, they have explicit handling of sequences, fallbacks and interruptions. Uh, and we will explain what we mean by that in the following slides. So how do we decide when to switch task? So imagine you have a task switching structure and you want to know when to switch. So thinking about it, it turns out there are three fundamental reasons to switch. Either you succeed with what you're doing, you fail with what you're doing, or you are interrupted by a more important task. So imagine the example of eating a banana Succeeding with eating the banana would probably mean that uh, the banana is gone. Failuring could be because you realized it was a bad banana. You don't want to eat it. Interruptions. Well, an example includes a fire alarm going off. Then you would probably stop eating your banana. Put it, um, put it somewhere and just uh, go for the exit. So that was how to decide when to switch. But how do we decide what to switch? Well, looking again at the three fundamental reasons, when we succeed, we probably want to continue some kind of sequence. We had a plan of doing something and then doing something else. So uh, imagine you want to open a banana, uh, peel, it, peel, peel a banana, uh, and then you succeed, you eat it, right? When failing, you realize the banana was bad. Uh, then you would probably want to invoke a fallback action. Why did you start eating a banana? You might have been hungry. Then it might make sense to eat an apple instead. So a fallback is something you invoke when, a, when an action fails. When interrupted, Obviously, it depends on the interruption. If the fire alarm goes off, you would probably start running somewhere, or at least walking fast. 
So, how does the behavior tree handle these three reasons explicitly? So, how does the behavior tree work? In this example behavior tree, we have four green boxes that are the actions. Eat sandwich, eat apple, open banana, and eat banana. The two white boxes are the interior nodes, the fallback indicated by a question mark, and the sequence indicated by an arrow. Remember, the fallback stops at the first child that returns success or running, and it continues uh, if the children fail, then it takes the next. So it's something, a fallback is something you do if what the thing you tried first doesn't work. So in this case, you first try eating the sandwich, and if that fails, you try eating the apple, and if that fails, you go on to the banana. Therefore, you can kind of read the fallback as or you eat the sandwich, or you eat the apple, or the banana. Conversely, the sequence is intended for actions that succeed and then you go on to the next. So the sequence stops at the first child that returns failure or running. And you can read the sequence as and. You open the banana and you eat the banana. If you fail in opening the banana, the sequence is not going to go on to try to eat the banana. The execution of the behavior tree is based on ticks. So first you tick the root of the tree and the tick is then progressed down and it's illustrated by this white downward po pointing arrow. Uh, the return statuses of actions and subtrees are illustrated by green, yellow and red arrows. Green for success, yellow for running and red for failure. So in this example, the tree the trees are always ticked with some given frequency, 10 times a second or something similar, depending on the time scale of, uh, of your agent and of your problem. So a tick comes down to the root, it's then progressed to the leftmost child, eat sandwich. So imagine this case, eat sandwich failed, failure comes up uh, to the fallback. And remember the fallback keeps ticking the next child as long as it gets failures. So failure from the first child, it takes the next child, you try to eat, the agent tries to eat the apple. If that returns running, it's currently trying to eat the apple and it's too early to say if it succeeded or failed, running is progressed up the tree and eat apple is action that is allowed to execute for that time step. However, if eat apple also returns failure, the fallback takes it next child that is the sequence operator in this case, which takes its first child, open banana. When open banana succeeds, the sequence goes on to tick the next child, eat banana. Imagine eat banana returns running, then running progresses up the tree. Running always is sent up the tree. Success and failure is different for the different interior nodes. So looking back at the advantages of behavior trees, we haven't looked at modularity yet. We haven't looked at hierarchical structure yet. We did see that the example had a clear graphical representation and we saw the explicit handling of sequences and fallbacks. So let's look at interruptions. So in this slide, we have two subtrees, the left and the right. At the right, we saw on the previous slide, the eating sandwich and apple and so on. Uh, in order to illustrate interruptions, we have a left subtree, which basically uh, is a fallback composition of no alarm and run away. So either there's no alarm or you run away. So imagine the, kick, the tick coming to the root progresses to the left, leftmost child uh, to the no alarm. So imagine no alarm succeeds, there is indeed no alarm, then the fallback is happy, success is progressed upwards, the tick goes down to the next child of the sequence, remember if the sequence succeeds, uh, you tick the next child, then we go on to eat the sandwich and so on. 
Uh, but imagine that's not the case. Uh, imagine no alarm at some point. This could progress for, for any amount of time, but at some point, no alarm returns failure because there is an alarm. The fallback is then going to tick the next child, run away, and the agent is going to immediately stop eating whatever it was eating or opening a banana or whatever and run away until no alarm return success again. That is, it can't hear the alarm or the alarm stopped. So whenever there's an alarm, the agent will interrupt whatever it's doing and run away. That's how behavior trees handle interruptions. So remember, this was handled in the subtree of its own and all, we didn't have to change anything uh, from the eating subtree was exactly as it was before. Looking back at the advantages of behavior trees, earlier we saw sequences, fallbacks, and graphical representation, and now we just saw interruptions. So what about modularity? Looking back at the subtree we started with, that of eating, we just saw that we could handle interruptions by adding uh, a combination of, of the eating subtree with this runaway when there is an alarm subtree uh, in this fashion. And we got uh, a safety behavior that is constantly checking uh, for an alarm. And if such an alarm does indeed sound, the agent runs away. Uh, but we have modularity and uh, a low degree of dependencies in other places of this tree. Imagine you want to eat something else, eat fries, maybe not so healthy, but uh, still an option. You can just plug that in like this. Uh, furthermore, open banana can be replaced by a little subtree uh, with two options, two fallbacks, either you break the banana open, which is most common, I guess, or you cut the banana open with a knife. Either of those, uh, if either of those succeed, you can go on and eat the banana. If both of them fail, it's very hard to eat the banana without opening it somehow. So you can add detail at any <coughs> part of the tree um, without having to worry about dependencies. What about hierarchical? We want a switching structure that can handle the many levels of detail that you have in an, a typical agent. Remember the example of, of going to work, which probably includes the actions of driving a car, which in turn probably includes the action of turning left or right which in turn probably includes the actions of moving in an arm or um, applying the brakes and so on. So looking back at our example again, uh, we have this subtree, which is different ways of opening the banana, which is then uh, part of this slightly larger subtree that eats the banana, first opens it in one of two ways and then eats it. And that can kind of be abstract it into one action, just eat banana. You can imagine eating sandwich is something similar. If the sandwich is wrapped before you get it, you have to unwrap it and then eat it. Uh, and looking e even higher in the subtree hierarchy, we have a subtree, uh, the whole subtree here, which is about eating stuff. So that can kind of be collapsed into one action. I'm going to eat and then I'm going to whatever you do after eating. So uh, there is indeed a hierarchy that is natural, uh, including uh, many levels of detail in the behavior trees. So in this example, we have hierarchical actions, eat something, eat a banana, open a banana and cut banana open. That kind of include each other's in a hierarchy as discussed. Again, looking back at the claimed advantages of behavior trees, we have seen modularity, few dependencies between components. It was easy to add 
eating fries, to add new ways of opening a banana, to add the interruptive safety behavior and so on without changing the other stuff. We've seen hierarchical structure in terms of eating can be broken down into opening and eating a banana or eating a sandwich instead and so on. We have seen the graphical representation and we've seen the explicit handling of sequences, fallbacks and interruptions. Finally, before we conclude this lecture, we're going to note the difference between actions and conditions. Uh, so far, we've been only dealing with actions, that is the green boxes. Eat fries, open a banana, uh, run away and so on. Turns out one of these boxes, the no alarm, is actually a condition rather than an action. So what is a condition? Well, it's a special case. It's an action that never returns running and does not change the world. So no alarm in this case is, should actually be a condition. And we draw conditions with ovals instead of rectangles. The only reason for doing this is that it improves readability. Otherwise, we could have called that an action too, since it kind of satisfies the requirements of actions. So to draw this properly, we should have drawn it like this. Thank you for watching. That concludes our introduction to behavior trees, why we use them and how they work, basically. Uh, if you want to learn more about behavior trees, uh, you might want to check out our book. It's available on archive for free or uh, in online bookshops. And we hope we've provided you some answers to the questions. What is a behavior tree and when are they useful? Thank you.